Welcome to crunch time. The European elections are just around the corner. I know we'd almost forgotten about them because of Brexit, but now they are back with a vengeance and you might have recognized the place we are sitting here. This is, of course, the seat of the European Parliament in Strasbourg and this is the last plenary session in this setup before the election. So it's time to discuss the EU elections and why they matter to Asia. Now, if you're sitting somewhere in Asia, you might ask yourself, why should I care about the European elections? Well, the EU is one of the biggest markets in the world. And in these times of globalization, everyone everywhere needs to care. Yep. And we're to discuss that with uh, a great panel. So stick with us and stick with our guests. On my left, for example, Barbara Lochpiele, who is a member of the European Greens and an expert, obviously, on Asia. And she says the guiding light for good governance in the region needs to be universal human rights. And on my right, we have Professor Dr. Shwebu Gu. He is from the Center for Global Studies in Bonn. And he says Europe and Asia need each other to overcome these times of uncertainty. I'm right over there, the youngest member of the European Parliament. So it's, it's his future we're also talking about here. It's, of course, Ralph Paquet. And he is from the ECR group, the European Conservatives and Reformists. And he says calling the Asian economies suddenly systemic rivals and competitors is going too far. Also with us is Mr. Gurjeet Singh. He's India's former ambassador to Germany. And he says Europe is not part of the strategic discussion in Asia. And last but not least, where is he? Helmut Schultz, a member of the European uh, left and a member of the EU-China delegation. He says Asia and Europe need to be the closest possible partners to overcome the global problems. Now, talking about problems and partners, Max, every time I talk about Europe and Asia, people say to me, you mean China. For many people here, Asia is synonymous with China. So let's first talk China. China is big. China is fast. China is high tech. The nation is striving for power to become the technology hub of the world. The Belt and Road Initiative, a 21st century Silk Road. It's been called either a Chinese Marshall Plan or a state-backed campaign for global dominance. But does the trade go both ways? We cannot let mutual suspicion get the better of us. Europe wants trade, but this has to lead to a reciprocity that we are still struggling to achieve. China needs markets. Europe needs access. But key European industries are increasingly falling under Chinese control. European enterprises need to get the same degree of access to the market as the Chinese get in Europe. China is a global player when it comes to digital infrastructure. Europeans have long been familiar with the dominance of Chinese giants like Huawei. Is China spying on Europe? None of us is naive. China relations facing new challenges. Time to honeymoon or play hardball? Yeah, honeymoon or hardball. Helmut <laughs> Schultz, you said you were looking for the closest possible relationship right here. Should we disregard the spying of China? Should we disregard the human rights situation and just go for a very close partnership? Close partnership includes human rights, as I would say. But this includes also, as others have said, that we are concentrating on the question how we can co co cooperate and that means that we have to focus on the social uh, issues on the economic issues on issues of human rights but of course also on the environmental issues the and Chinese that is in the global really understanding. Seem to care about that at least in the past when it comes to the human rights situation so is that really effective 
It is effective. The question is, it is maybe not enough effective, but it is going into the right direction. And here I see uh, really a development in the bilateral relationship, and we have to continue to strengthen also the attention on the human rights. Now, Ralph Paquette, now the EU has just come up with a very assertive policy towards China recently. It's called China a systemic rival and with alternative forms of governance. You feel that's going too far. Why? Well, I wouldn't always call this assertive because some uh, powers in Europe really have admi uh, admiration for the, uh, the Chinese state system. I wouldn't go that far, but I also don't want to be naive. So I really want to uh, point out that there are real challenges uh, regarding China. I will need to break up this public uh, procurement market. Uh, China need to respect copyright uh, and need to stop uh, forcing this uh, technology transfer that European companies face in Europe. Those are challenges, but those challenges don't mean that we need to turn away from global cooperation, that we need to start closing ourselves to work towards the open market, because the openness and, and the freedom of markets that Europe always showed in the past is, is exactly what made Europe great, and we should maintain this openness towards all partners in the future. Ms. Lopila, would you say, would you agree with that, uh, saying it's the wrong term, systemic rivals? Well, no. I think uh, also what you said at the entrance, that uh, China and Europe, we have to work together in multilateral fora like the United Nations because we have a high-risk time. Yeah, Base our common policies on the rule of law and the rules-based order. And I think China could do much more. Now China is expanding in the United Nations, fills a lot of gaps when the U.S. Uh, pulled out. But I think that there's a lack of um, conditioning it also on human rights protection. And I think now we have five EU member states in the Security Council, two permanents, three non-permanents. And still, uh, China should be more cooperative, for example, to refer severe human rights cases like in Myanmar, the case of the Rohingya to the International Criminal Court or at the Human Rights uh, Council itself but, to find opportunities to work together. But do you agree with the term systemic rivals? Are we rivals or are we partners? Well, I think we are partners. I think the terminology... So you don't agree with what the EU the, Commission said? The terminology rival is very limited to being rival on the economic market. We, I see the European Union also as a political entity. And there should, we should refine our wording and seek opportunities to work together while at the same time critiquing where we have different, for example, different values. Uh, Professor, Professor Gu, um, uh, Ms. Lockwheeler says that there is rivals at uh, an economic sense with China, but would you argue that China is also has political aspirations of dominance through its various projects within the EU? It's playing divide and rule within the EU through projects like the, the Belt and Road Initiative? I think uh, there is a lot of misunderstanding about the Chinese uh, one bit one road initiatives. Indeed, if you uh, really consider the situation, for me, the Chinese uh, new Silk Road initiative is indeed a decent strategy towards the United States, which is a reaction to the Americans' pivot to Asia policy. So the Chinese government didn't want to go directly into front confrontation to the United States, they have developed this strategy to go away indeed to this area and turn the face to the European countries with the idea, three ideas. The second, the, the first one is to find a new way to create a new market for Chinese economy. The second is uh, to avoid direct confrontation in Pacific Rome. The second, the last one is to find a way to give Chinese uh, to society some new possibility to give the Islamic areas, which is totally um, separated from the globalization, new chance to get economic development. But this project is somehow misread and misunderstood from the whole world. Ambassador, uh, do you feel like the project is misunderstood? Because I understand India is not participating at all, indeed categorically refusing to participate because they have a completely different understanding of one belt, one road that think, we just heard uh, from we Professor we understand Trump. things well, and I think the terminology systemic rival is a good and apt one. I think Europe stops need to 
stops trying to namby pamby China. They need to come up up front and stand up for what they believe in. You can't have economics leading you by the nose so that all your values are surrendered. You have to emphasize human values beyond human rights, which is a very wide area. But why is India But not participating? But India does not, because we believe Obor is not looking out for other countries' interests political, strategic, and economic. And we do not want the world to become a kind of a stimulus package for the Chinese economy. So, Prof. Uh, um, Helmut Scholz, now he's talking about uh, uh, Ambassador Singh is saying one should not namby-pamby China. Now, the EU has come up with its own Asia-Europe connectivity package. Do you think that is Europe's answer to OBOR or the One Belt, One Road initiative? I would not say that it's just the opposite issue, but here we have to find channels to, to combine these uh, different plans, etc. because I would not agree uh, totally with you, but I would say that this rivalry uh, understanding mm -hmm. is just describing more than only economic rivals. Mm -hmm. It is a way of how we are t treating each other, and that is a term uh, from the Cold War times, and that means we are competing each other to to, to break the other one, economically, politically, etc. And that, I think, is leading, if we are looking into the, to the global challenge and to the wrong direction. So if, for example, 1.4 billion people in China want to live the way of we are in the Europe, Europe are living, or 1.3 million, a billion in, 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 in India and, and one more billion in, in other Asian countries. So what does it mean for resources? What does it mean for the energy production? What does it mean for the climate? So here I think we have really the obligation to find channels to cooperate. And I would welcome that India is participating in these different plans. And we'll talk about that uh, more later, about uh, India's, India's role in that. But I think it's safe to say that, of course, China is much more involved nowadays in Europe Europe, and not only on the fringes, but in the European Union as well than it was in the past. We prepared a tweet uh, from that because uh, Greece obviously is one of the countries where uh, there was a lot of investment, Chinese investment in the last years. And this tweet is from Alexis Tsipras, the Greek uh, prime minister. I think we have that. Uh, and it says, meeting with the Chinese president Xi Jinping, Greece is a bridge between East and West, China and the EU. Now, this uh, tweet uh, is a couple of years old, but uh, it is is, well, it's more relevant than ever, it seems. And wouldn't you say, Professor, that some people in Europe could feel threatened by Chinese activity as of late? I think the, the feeling, the perception of the Chinese threat is understandable. It's understandable because of two reasons. The first one is uh, we have uh, people living in, in European countries, they have no experience with a country which is under the rule of the Communist Party with tremendous new power resources going into the continent. New phenomenon. Nobody has experienced. The second one is misunderstanding. Because why? Because the Chinese, they, they have the feeling we just come to you uh, only with capital, with new project to work with you together. Why are your reaction so negative? What is our our thread? That is a big question discussing in China. They have also some trouble with the European uh, refuse of Chinese project. I believe there is a huge demand for big bridge connecting both sides because the Chinese for them is, 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 uh, is economic project, not the geopolitical ambitions. Um, Fran Lockmiller, do you agree with that? Uh, because there is a lot of concern in the EU about China's influence, not just within Europe, but within Eastern Europe. We have the 16.1 initiative. Greece has now joined the 16 uh, plus 1 initiative. It's now 17 uh, uh, plus 1. Did, in fact, Europe throw these countries in, into the arms uh, of the Chinese because they put such a squeeze on countries like Greece, not giving them money, forcing them to sell their assets to willing buyers like China? Well, I would dis uh, uh, agree with you in one point. I think uh, China uh, openly used its influence and its economic ties, for example, with Greece, and conditioned it two years ago. And you say, because you depend on our economic 
uh, aid or support, you have not to vote to critique China in the Human Rights Council. And this kind of policy is very rational that the European side critiques this. Because the European Union can be only strong in a uh, multilateral fora if we speak with one voice. And this was a clear attack to split. And I think uh, this uh, China should uh, seek different forms to engage and to work together by strengthening and not weakening the human rights agenda. Well, if I may, we shouldn't be scared of our own shadow. Uh, Europe is the biggest uh, global economy. We are the biggest uh, trading bloc of the world. We are the biggest eco uh, export partner of China. And we should respect ourselves with this position. This is the only way to be more assertive, to sit around the table with China. And I'm not scared of these investments in the East, in, in the Balkan and so on, because uh, recent projects have uh, clearly shown that China fails to deliver uh, a lot of time in Romania with the power plants, in uh, Montenegro with, uh, with the road building. So this country also understand that. And China has major difficulties um, um, uh, applying these, the, the European rules regarding procurement. It but has, they're getting better at it, just like uh, they have, for example, with technology transfer in the last years. No, but we see, for example, with the project in Montenegro with the road, that they really uh, underestimate the complexity of the local regions. And and, and I think this, this type of collaboration will never replace uh, European Union, but it can work complementary in certain cases. But we should really look and respect our own, our own position on a global level and not be scared of our own shadow. I mean, one of the big concerns here, Ralph Paquet, is that when um, China is investing in some of these Eastern European and Balkan countries, they're investing in critical infrastructure mm -hmm. and in countries which have actually limited financial resources, creating what people fear is a debt trap. So these countries then have a certain dependency on China, which worries uh, the EU. This is exactly where we need a really assertive policy. And we are doing that. We recently made this foreign uh, direct investment screen uh, system where uh, the European Union provides a framework where member states can really screen foreign investments. And, and this will temper China's, uh, China's eagerness to, to invest in strategic sectors. So this really shows that we can play on the uh, same equal level fields. And if we uh, maintain this global position, then we can work together with China and from a Europe's point of, per of, of uh, perspective, shape the world in, in a global uh, trading system with fair rules and, and open trade. I think this Pardon? is what I call the Nambi Bambi approach. I mean, you see, you really can't be serious, as, as the Honorable Packet says. China is not following global rules. China is taking advantage of the weakness of current globalization and stepping in with their version of globalization. I don't think they worry about European investment rules. They are worried not even so much about the debt they create. They are trying to export their way out of economic trouble. It is the domestic Chinese issue which they are trying to export to different parts of the world. And this is what is dangerous to us. So I think we had Mr. Schultz who wanted to say something, but direct reaction from you know, Professor Gu. I, I, I do believe that the Chinese government, um, um, you're right, certainly China has a lot of uh, things to improve, certainly. I think the, the government, uh, all the Chinese people, especially the private companies, if they go out to European countries, they do try to play with the game, with the, with the rules of the WTO. The majority, I would say that. So the second point I want to make is, please, respect, respect the sovereign decision power of the European countries and the companies, people doing business with China. We cannot afford to underestimate their conscious decision made by different European countries, by Greece and by small East European countries, they are sovereign decision. You don't like that. Okay, but you, there's no reason for you to criticize them for them to cooperate with China. Because, uh, took a look at the, uh, the R10 and the Italian government, they do have the interest, they do exactly know what they are doing. And they do take the Chinese on the check if they are playing after the global in the Italian rule of law. So I, I believe we have to separate our own opinion and the reality happened in the reality.
Helmut Schulz, you wanted to add something to yeah, that? I wanted to add that some of the problems we are just discussing are of also homemade. Mm -hmm. If in the European Union we are carrying out for decades already now an austerity policy, cutting down and saving, etc., mm -hmm. so then the countries have no chance to invest and to, to find money for, uh, for the development of their own economies. So, and then I would not fear that investments are coming from China or from India or from the United States or somewhere else, or the, our own resources. And that could not only be private um, um, uh, um, private capital. It must be also the states who are obliged to, to develop their own economies. And here I think we have a, to, to change the agenda. So if we really want to deal with the social and the, and the environmental challenges, we have to invest together. And I would s stop the thinking and one against the other. No, we have a common obligation and here I think really that we should develop a new strategy in a, in a, in a global understanding and, and to interfere into the way of how the macroeconomic systems and structures are functioning. So we've talked a lot about how Europeans feel about Chinese investment, about the Chinese role in the European <laughs> Union. Because we have the EU elections just around the corner, I would like to know from uh, Professor Gu. Do people in your country know at all that there are EU elections? Absolutely, absolutely. Maybe in and then what, what are their expectations? Uh, in difference to India, European question has been a strategic question in Chinese discourse, political and economic discourse, because, because of two reasons. The first one is, as you uh, just uh, mentioned, European Union is one of the biggest single market. The Chinese social life jobs somehow depend on the, on the economic situation in European country. The second point is much more important because the majority of Chinese think tanks and the strategy, they believe uh, we need a stronger, prospering, stable European Union as, you know, as help, as so assistance, as partner Brexit, for example. towards Washington. Towards Washington. Mm. So they do believe we have to do everything to keep the relation to European country uh, in, uh, stable. So they, are, have, they have interest to see how the European Parliament work. It's a lot of people are very worried about Brexit because they believe uh, if the, Europe, the Britain move out of the European Union, which is bigger, bigger lose for German Chancellor Angela Merkel, and they will complicate the future economic and political cooperation, and China will lose a bigger uh, partner in terms of uh, the fight for the remaining of multinationalism. So they do have interest to mm. look at the result of the European elections. Ms. Lochbieler, yeah. you've been on the continent a lot in Asia. Yes. <laughs> do you have? Do you do you bring these two things together sometimes? The EU elections and these this region that you know so much about, you're so interested in. Well, of course, you see the ASEAN countries. They uh, look carefully how the European Union is developing connectivity and to work together, and um, so they they don't understand sometimes, and they are disappointed that we destroy the European Union from itself because uh, the gains by working together are obvious, and that is I, I feel uh, so sorry. Uh, and I also think when they look, for example, ASEAN countries to China and the influence in the region, it is again that. There is no, I wouldn't say hostility, uh, but still demanding from China, please, a strengthen a rules-based order, like the conflict, a uh, real severe conflict in the South China Sea, where uh, a, a hot conflict could develop, uh, then learning could how, what is the European position, but also uh, referring to the court's decision actually that China should also accept uh, legal decisions me, and not go for being a dominant Very power. important topic obviously but th just let me get back to that one point. Where do you feel the EU elections really matter in the region? On, on what topic? Well, I think if you see uh, in the building up of uh, the, to the European elections, all those parties who have a, de a clear racist uh, policy against migrants and foreigners, not so much against Asians, but 
if they would come also against Asians, this worries them. Because our, our, uh, in the center of the European Union is also that we are kind of a value driven, <laughs> that a human being has its dignity and should not be violated. But if I look at the problem is... misunderstanding of that in the European Union such extreme right wings can gain so much, mm. this is very worrisome in the Asia but region. In Asia, when you talk about human rights and about protecting rights of people like the Rohingyas and the Uyghurs mm. in China, the Muslim minority there, People often in Asia say the EU applies double standards. If they have an economic interest in a country, suddenly human rights don't matter. Like, for example, in China, mm -hmm. uh, it's raised sometimes, but not often. But in a country like Myanmar, where there's not much economic stake for the EU, suddenly they jump on a human rights issue. Would you agree with that? No, I disagree. And also I hear different voices from Asia. It depends if you listen to government voices or civil society and human rights uh, organizations, which there are plenty of in the region. I think the EU is too soft when they talk uh, human rights with China, for example. Last week we had a summit. Not Merkel, not Macron, not Mogherini said a single a critique and there are many human rights violations mm -hmm. and I think this is a critique we should take the European Union uh, but I think it's not only because of if there is an in, uh, uh, economic interest the EU is uh, active because also in Myanmar there's a lot of economic uh, interest uh, by the European Union to get at this market but the the size of the violations was quite, violation was huge professor Gu, I have I have good news for you yeah yeah, because after the criticism we had from the ambassador of, uh, towards China, you will be able to, to give it back uh, in a second because, as we can see, China is a difficult topic, also because of the human rights situation. We won't have complete agreement here, but there's an alternative, maybe, in Asia, uh, which is India. India is a big democracy. India is set to become the most populous country, uh, overtake uh, China. But, you know, what am I talking about? Let's just watch this movie. India, the world's biggest democracy and fastest growing large economy. The country is thriving, emerging as a global player ready for global challenges. The EU is India's first trading partner, but they both want deeper cooperation in other key areas. We're faced with the same global challenges, such as climate, renewable energy and security. Democratic India is closer politically to the EU than China. They would seem natural partners, but the relationship hasn't taken off. Why? I believe it's time for a free trade agreement between India and the European Union. Once the conditions are right, and only once the conditions are right. The EU and India are both strong supporters of a global order based on multilateralism and shared values. India's know-how is promising, but EU-India relations are far from tapping their full potential. What secret ingredient is missing to help take this relationship to the next level? And that is the question I'm going to put to you, Ambassador Gurjeet Singh. What secret ingredient is missing to bring Europe and India into a level of partnership that would be commensurate with their uh, natural uh, uh, proclivities? Both are democracies. See, we are not a honeymooning couple anymore. India and Europe... We never were to begin yeah, India with. India and Europe today way. are a middle-aged couple. <laughs> we need to adapt ourselves to a long married life. And we need to see how our grandchildren are going to inherit this earth. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I think Europe needs to pick up and stop looking at small, important, but small, single-minded activities and look at the broad swath of a partnership with India. For instance, uh, trade. Without trade, there's nothing. Without investment, there's nothing. But you have, we have held up the India-EU bilateral trade agreement for years on, frankly, wine and Italian marines. I mean, this is not where big countries should look. So we need a much bigger approach. India also waits that there should be some new sparks. How about an educational partnership? How about a scientific and technological partnership? How about a partnership where we bring change to the world and its people? Those are the common values that we must look at beyond security and trade. Sounds sensible, uh, Mr. Packett, well, doesn't it? I have a different approach because I think where the uh, partnership really holds is a lack of ambition on India's side. 
we are already negotiating about a free trade agreement with India for almost uh, or more than 10 years. And it's India who fails to deliver commitment to open its market, to uh, show commitment regarding sustainable development and uh, labor policies. This is not from Europe's side. We want to invest, we want to go there, but now you see them go back into this uh, new flagship from India, the, the Made in India program uh, and I think that if we would uh, be able to attract European investments into India that it would be benefit for uh, beneficiary for both sides um, investments from Europe could bring economic Indian growth could be a job creation in India. So this would actually be in this program of uh, Made in India, but the lack of ambition, uh, ambition is not from Europe, but uh, in, in, in India. Now, Hel Helmut Schulz, the EU has come up with a new EU strategy for India. Do you share uh, 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 Ralf uh, Paquette's views there? Uh, partly I share his position as well. I would also understand the ambassador. Because I think there is a truth in both positions. Mm. So of course in India there must be also the chance for India to get the development on its own. So if you are looking for food sovereignty and food uh, guaranteeing for everybody in, in, in such a continent as India, um, then of course they have the right to, to look what is their original national approach to do so. On the other hand, I would say we have to look into developing the multilateral trading system instead of only looking into bilateral agreements. So with China, we are just negotiating already also for uh, six years investment uh, protection agreement, which is uh, a huge uh, agreement and where we, we should include a trade and sustainable development chapter. That must be also uh, realized in such a free trade agreement with, with India. But that means we have to understand what are the rules, what are the standards for that. And this we have to develop within the WTO system because the WTO is changing itself, its nature today in the, in the 21st century, uh, in the second or third decade already. So we have climate, social issues, human rights, mm -hmm. political stability, to be also benchmarks for shaping this trade, because trade is today about production and consumption. But already there's trouble, as you mentioned, Ambassador, with some alcoholic beverages. I, I believe it was also whiskey because, yes. of, uh, <laughs> because of the United Kingdom. That might get easier. But Ms. Lochbiller, if you had uh, some concrete requests that you would like to formulate towards India, what's that? Well. As I see it, I think India has very good structures and laws on human rights, constitution and so on. The biggest problem is in the implementation and in the huge disparity between the rich and many, many very poor and how to overcome this. Mm -hmm. And I think whenever the European Union is planning and going further to do a free trade agreement, they have to do a human rights impact assessment first. Because I remember when, I think it was uh, Barroso, when he traveled um, to India, Actually, he traveled to China and stopped in India, and he made a public uh, press conference, and he said, oh, we do free trade agreement. Now, all the initiatives who are dealing with, for example, the right to health, they looked into what would this mean if European companies produce expensive pharmaceutical medicine on HIV in India. Then the market for those com Indian companies who produce it cheaper is lost. And then what about the poor people? So all these issues, I think, I would have uh, discussing with India. Do you feel more comfortable with India as a trading partner of the EU than with China? Well, that is a question I cannot answer because I think it's a wrong question. Because I think, look, if what is best for the people in the respective countries or region is the matter. And trade is not per se bad or good. Yeah, but as and a human rights expert. I, I would say that uh, in, in China the problem is that the government uh, does not tolerate uh, critique. Yeah, and is very strong and strict against minorities. This week we will have a, a, a resolution on the Uyghur situation again. In India, and both countries, I have to say, did enormous uh, progress in fighting uh, poverty, which is uh, the essential, uh, the SDG number one. Uh, but now in India it is more easier because the government seems a little bit more relaxed with the critique. But the biggest problem is there in the implementation. I think that's also the main issue which drives the election. 
connections, I assume. In fact, you know, the EU has been talking for a long time about building closer relations with India, strategic partnership, which they already have. They've talked about turning common principles into common interests. In fact, let me just read out a quote from Juncker. This was, uh, uh, he, he wrote in back in 2017, I'm more convinced than ever that India and the EU become um, uh, uh, beacons of democracy and tolerance must shape the world together. And in the new policy uh, strategy statement, which has come out from the EU, there's talk about um, the EU welcoming a multipolar Asia. Now, mm -hmm. Professor Gu, how do you feel about this concept of a multipolar Asia? Because the other regional rival for India in the region in Asia is China. We, we do have a multipolar uh, structure, construction, in terms of uh, security um, uh, development in in Asia, East Asia, and Southeast Asia too. India, China, Japan, and other countries, they, do, they are very, you know, sovereign and independent. So if European countries talking about uh, strategic partnership, the question is for what? I think for European countries, maybe the, the idea is to create a new venue community against the possible authoritarian um, coalition between Russia and China, maybe. The second point is the strategic partnership to help India to move, to reform the country more uh, in direction of uh, um, market economy. So I have the feeling the European, the expectation of Brussels, of, of uh, European friends towards uh, India uh, seems to be too, too quick. Don't forget, India has began the economic reform 20 years later than China, about 90, uh, at the beginning of 90. That means there was a lot of bureaucratic uh, overstakes uh, to be removed. And that is the worst reason why the implication, why the implementation has gone very, very slow. So generally, I do believe the expectation of European countries as a totally postmodern country towards India and China, they are characterized by the, the tendency of loss of patience. You know, we need more time. We need more time in European giving for China, but also for India. So that is the, it's a gap between the two levels of development. Raf Baki, do you believe that Brexit could be the EU's, uh, um, would work in favor of you having closer ties with India? Uh, certainly not, because uh, the UK was always a bigger partner that was always in favor of free market, open market, and this is a partner we, we might lose. So this will have a big impact. And as a European Union, we need to be way more assertive towards these uh, trading partners. But something that is often left out of this uh, debate is that a strong global position actually starts with your, all, with your own internal decisiveness. And if we sit across the table with trading partners and they see that we in Europe, we have huge internal debts, that we have a very weak immigration policy, that we always hesitate to face our terror threats, we need to show the world that we can face our own challenges. We need to show that we can handle our own threats and this is how we can be a strong partner on a global level and also gain way more respect. Um, Ambassador, yeah, yes, you I would can like react to, to that, but let me, maybe yeah. with a little caveat, a little addition here, because uh, what our MEP here just mentioned, of course, is important. How does India feel about, let's say, the threat of more and more right-wing populists coming into the European Parliament with the upcoming elections? Does that play a role? No. I think you must pardon me on that. India is busy with its own election. And the same day, by the way, 23rd of May. <laughs> so right now, I don't think we are take, thinking too much of other people's elections. But all elections are important because you get an articulation of the human mind. And more free the human mind, the better the articulation. So yes, the results of the European election will help us to form our, what he calls, ambition towards the European Union. But don't expect India to give up all the gains of the WTO and our slow movement into the climate change support and into becoming supporters of globalization at the threshold of an agreement with the European Union. We are just not going to do it. We need your help to protect those gains, not lose them. Now, I think he made some, uh, Honorable Packet makes an interesting point. I think India and Europe 
need to work together on security cooperation in dealing with non-traditional threats. We have done it in piracy. We need to do it more on terrorism. We need to do it on illegal migration. We need to do it on drugs. And we need to do it on cyber security and on money laundering. These are the real threats. Now here, borders don't matter. Here we just need European understanding and on the ground operation. I think this year I have seen much more positive European reaction of the many members in the Security Council that she mentioned in support of these ventures. You're talking about security, Helmut Schul, Schultz, in the new strategy from the EU, they want to have closer defense ties with India. They talk about joint military exercises, they talk about having an EU military envoy in India and vice versa. Do you think Europe needs to be a little more assertive in terms of hard security in the Asia Pacific? region? No. I fully disagree with this position because this is just misleading. So if you are putting, Barbara Lochbiller, she said that we should judge also the human rights situation from the perspective of citizens and not only from the functioning of the states of the systems. And I think if you are speaking about security issues, etc., we have to, first of all, to deal with the social equal chances for everybody in our societies. Because that, the, the fear of going into poverty, which is one of the stimulus for the right populist parties here in, in, in the European Union, uh, uh, can only be tackled if we are developing our economies, our societies, and opening it for chances for everybody. Also for a, for a woman which is alone and, and, and taking care about her child, <coughs> or the man who is doing the same issue. So, I mean, this is a problem, and here we think we have to, to, to organize a cooperation between mm -hmm. India and the European Union, between China and the European Union, or taking other uh, countries of the Asian um, continent. For example, in the free trade agreement with Japan, yeah. we agreed to include the quite progressive data protection uh, regulations and laws of the European Union Understood. as a benchmark yeah. also for the bilateral cooperation in the trade <laughs> aspects. And I think this could be also an example for the cooperation so, with China if we are dealing with the investment agreement. So we've had some fascinating insights till now, but now we want to have Max some fun and games. Yes, I hope it's fun <laughs> for everybody. So you only get to answer with one word for the following. I think we have two questions. The first one is, what are you looking for in the outcome of the EU elections? Which part of the EU elections are you really looking at, Ambassador? Support to globalization. Respect the rule of law. Democratization. Reinforcement of Martin Arrhenius. Uh, safety and competitiveness. Okay, Helmut Schulz wins that role because he was the only one who gave a one-word answer. <laughs> and I have a second question for you. Finish the sentence. Europe and Asia are uh, partners in global cooperation. Need each other to overcome the very complicated uh, upcoming future in the uh, time. Uh, needs to have an equal living playing field. Need and support each other. Hand in hand. Hand in hand. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. It was great to have all of you on this wide-ranging uh, discussion about EU elections and why they should matter to Asia. Thank you very much. And to all of you, wherever you might be listening, from Max Hoffman and me, thank you very much for your company. It was great to have you with us. And of course, uh, stick around in the next uh, months or weeks, actually, because like I said in the beginning, the EU elections are just around the corner. And uh, we hope to see you there on DW when we cover this important event for the European Union.